This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. <laughs> Okie dokie, folks. Horticulture's Phil DeRussian, and me and Abram Nanny, and all the folks at MPB, we're going to be yakking with you about gardening. First weekend in June of 2023. Anyway, how, how are you this morning? I'm good. It is Friday. <laughs> yeah. It is Friday, and I feel every bit of it. Even though we had a quick or a long weekend, and it was a quick week, I feel every bit of the Friday. Yeah, you were, we were talking earlier. You said your yard's not looking too good right no, now. No, it's not. I mowed it last week, and before I did, I tried to pick up some of the flowers and put them in like this flower pot that we had. Mm-hmm killed all of them yeah that, 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 that happened <laughs> and by this time of year there's a lot of wildflowers blooming along the roadside and people are digging them up and taking them home mm-hmm. which sort of makes sense you know it's not exactly ethical matter of fact it may be illegal in some places but the worst part about it is a lot of these wildflowers that are blooming right now they're they're dying already people don't realize wildflowers most of them that are out there now they sprout the seeds sprout in the fall they grow over the winter time they flower in the spring they set seed and they die. They, they're they gone. So when the people dig it up, it's already a dying plant. If you're going to do that, get you some seed. Collect some of the seeds, you know, the dried up flowers, and then throw those on the ground, and they'll be back stronger than ever next year. But I'm not going to be preaching to people, telling them what they should or shouldn't do. That's up to the, that's up to the highway patrol, I guess. But uh, anyway, a lot of people are dividing their plants and moving stuff around. And when a plant's in full bloom, all of its energy is going up into flowers. And when you dig it up, you leave the, you know, if, if you stick your arms straight out and wiggle your fingers, that's where the important roots are. And you leave those behind, you're basically moving the shoulders and the neck. And it's really rough on plants to move it while it's in bloom. Yeah, I guess I kind of... Uh decapitated those plants when yeah. I tried to move them. Yeah, but that's okay. You know, live and learn. I've done it myself. Um, it's kind of interesting. I've, I'm sitting here. Hang on. Hang on a second. I've got new glasses. If I put these on, let me just try this. Can you see this? Tell me when you can see this. I see Nick, and I can't tell where Nick's calling from. Uh, Kibby, I believe. Okay, Kibby. Good morning, Nick. How are you doing? Good morning, Taylor, and everyone. How's everyone doing? So far, so good. I'm you- great. What you got going on? Got, got a simple question for you today. I'm not going to try to complicate things. Uh, got raised, uh, gar- raised boxes, got tomatoes in them. Uh, I got uh, garden soil purchased in out of sacks, uh-huh. big box stores. And my question is, uh, is calcium nitrate good or would it will squash benefit from calcium nitrate? That's a good question, and first of all, calcium nitrate, for folks who, who aren't familiar, is an agriculture fertilizer, like ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate. These are agriculture fertilizers that people use in a home garden, and uh, and they can be used, but the problem is they're really, really strong. And uh, plant garden plants, unlike agriculture, garden plants like a nice, steady kind of a slow, even feeding, and it's better to use something that's got a longer lasting. Calcium nitrate is a shot. It's like giving plants a shot of sugar or like giving kids a shot of sugar. If you give them too much, they're going to bounce off the walls, and then it disappears. So anyway, to answer your question, calcium nitrate is a, a, a good force of cal- source of calcium. It's got uh, uh, and nitrogen, um, and, and it works fine, but just a pinch will do it. And and it's not it is only one of the nutrients that plants need. They need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, and calcium, and zinc, and all that. So it's just the main. It's just two of the ingredients. It's like going to a restaurant and they only bring you potatoes and green beans. Long story short, yeah, calcium nitrate is fine. Wash, wash. Well, no, for for any kind of plant. But but again, it's just the nitrogen, little calcium. It's not enough on its own to fertilize plants it's just one it's just two of the nutrients that they need so uh, but it doesn't matter whether it's squash or okra or or beans or or, or tomatoes or peppers or whatever it's just nitrogen with a little calcium in it and by itself okay, well, it, it ain't enough i didn't 
I didn't tell you that I that I treated the soil with uh, osmocote before. Okay, I, I you you right. you have already given them all the fertilizer they need. No sense in overdosing it. I mean, the calcium. Thank you very much. Yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we have a lot of problems. Um, with tomatoes, sometimes peppers, and sometimes melons, where the bottom end of it uh, decays. It's called blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is a lack of calcium in the rapidly developing fruit, kind of like a little leathery spot on the bottom of it. And uh, calcium is important for plants, but you can have plenty of calcium in your soil, and if the plants stay a little too wet or a little too dry, they can't absorb that larger calcium molecule. They get blossom and rot anyway. So blossom and rot a lot of times is a watering issue uh, rather than a lack of calcium itself in the, in the garden. But if you put a little lime in your garden, agricultural lime, every three or four years and watch your watering, you shouldn't need to add any, any extra calcium. Okay, now let's go to Pearl. We'll talk with Alan. Alan, good morning. What's up with your lantana? Hey, Mr. Taylor. I... I um, talked to you a week or so ago about the lantanas out here at the state hospital. Yeah. You know, here we go. I mean, they look so beautiful, but yet um, the same old thing. And I took a leaf off and looked at it. I don't see any spider mites or any scale or anything. And it may be lace bug, um, but well, is there any kind of insecticide that I could spray on these? Um, without harming the butterflies and stuff like that. Well, to, let, me, let me address first thing. Lace bugs, you can see lace bugs because they 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 look like little. I hate to say like a little scab or something. They're they're little tiny little things, but they have their shell is clear around the edge. So, uh, uh, anyway, lace bugs. And uh, spider mites, uh, you got to really look for them pretty close. You can tell if you got lace bugs and other things because the bottom of the leaves will have little tiny, round, dark, almost black dots. That's their excrement. They, they do. Yeah, well, it's a little little round yeah. spots on there. That's that's lace bugs, and uh, you know yeah. what, when you turn it over, they draw, and they're sucking sap out of it, just like uh, yeah. like spider mites. But to answer your question, no, what will kill them will definitely uh, harm bees and butterflies. You can get around that, though, if you use something like pyrethrin, which is a natural insect. It's powerful. It's strong. It'll kill bees all right. and all kind of stuff, but it, it doesn't last very long. So if you'll spray late in the day, you know, maybe you, that means you got to stay after work. But if you'll spray right. when the bees and butterflies have gone in for the day and get the right. under underside of the leaves, then it'll be gone by the next morning. And but right. that that means somebody's got to stay till this time of this time of year, seven o'clock because it's still light. It's there's still bees out there at seven. Right. Well, it's just sad. I mean, they look good all over the campus, and then we get this sweep through here, and he just kills everybody. Uh, yep. Yep. So. Yeah. It's, it's it's a tough one, and uh, we had so much humidity and and rain back in early in the spring, and then the humidity this this uh the past couple of three weeks that we're getting a lot of leaf disease. These plants grow, they're, they're native to Mediterranean climates where it's right. low humidity and not that much rainfall. So lantanas, yeah. you know, luck of the draw. Luck of the draw. Right, okay. All right. And my yard for it lies, I went out and tried to find some good slow release. You can't hardly find anything anymore. Um, and the only thing I could find was um, fifteen zero fifteen. It's a slow release. Of yeah, that's a good plant. one. Yeah, it's got yeah, that stuff. That stuff has tripled in price. So. <laughs> yeah, it it has. But now here's the tip. You talking about for the lawn? Yeah, for my son always. Yeah, here's the tip. A lot of people don't realize this. Commercial fertilizers. The direction of how to use them. Or because they're put out by somebody selling fertilizer, they recommend the maximum legally they can recommend. You can make that bag go twice as far as it says it'll go. Your plant will be just as pretty at half the cost. Right. But uh, yeah. no, that's it's got a little ammonium nitrate to sort of kick things off. It's got urea nitrogen, which is nice, slow, and long lasting. But anyway, right. just make the bags go twice as far. And you know, your your mama and and aunts and uncles, they didn't ever fertilize their grass, and it looked fine. So you don't have to fertilize it every year. You know, this is no. this yeah. is something that people. Yeah. You know, if you'll fertilize it every. Two or three or four years, and then recycle your clippings. You don't need to push grass with fertilizer. That's a that's a a, a marketing myth. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Uh, good, good luck on it. Show. Okay. Appreciate right. it, man. All right. Bye bye. 
Oh, boy. No, we're having a lot of problems with insects right now for some reason. Uh, getting a lot of calls about that. But anyway, let's slide down to Pearl River County. Go down to the Gulf Coast and talk to Cheryl. Cheryl, good morning. Good morning, Felder. How are you? I was hoping somebody could explain why the Mississippi Highway Department slaughtering all the beautiful magnolias in the neutral ground yeah. uh, on our 59 in South Pearl River County. Uh, it's so sad. I know. Uh, you know, this was a pro- program started by the Garden Clothes in Mississippi called the Avenue of Magnolias, where the first 14 miles, I think, of all the major eight major entrances to the state where they planted magnolias. And it was a real good program. And of course, a lot of the trees got stolen or got mowed down or run over. Um, but I, th- I heard, I haven't researched this because it just started happening recently. Uh, I heard somebody say, and I, and I, I looked this up, that it's because of, uh, of safety issues. And the highway departments it was going to lose their funding from the federal people if they didn't remove obstructions in, you know, in case somebody runs off the road. That's what I heard. It makes sense. I just don't know if that's true or not. But I guarantee you they're not doing it because somebody just said we need to get rid of them. There's somebody making them do it for some reason. I suspect this. I think it's the this the federal uh, people saying, you know, we've got potential lobby. It might be somebody ran off the road and wrapped a car around one, and they're going to get rid of all of them because of that. It's so sad. Oh, I know, I know. You know, it's uh, and and, and it was such a cool thing. Matter of fact, uh, garden clubs used to be when I would give a lecture to garden club. Uh, when I worked for the university, I couldn't accept honorariums, and so they would plant a magnolia in my name. So they're cutting down my trees. <laughs> there you go. But I, I wish there's something we do about it. Maybe we could get them to plant them back up, you know, instead of in the medians, you know, to you know, put them back up along the tree line. And uh, and that'll, that'll also save on their equipment because those big old gang mowers that they use, they can't go around trees real easy. So they're being sacrificed for federal money. Well, you know, it is a federal, it is their highway. It's, a, it's, it's not sacrifice. It's their, you know, this is a, it's a socialist program there putting in highways in Mississippi, but it's paid for by, it, it's a federal property. And uh, they have rules. I'm, I'm retired from federal, and believe me, they got some dumb rules, but somebody has a reason for it. There you go. Yeah, I'm not happy about it either, but. You know, and I'll I'll try to find out what the deal is because a lot of people are on Mississippi Gardening Facebook. A lot of people have written about it. I just hadn't had a chance to study up on it. Thank you. Okay, hey, I appreciate your concern about it. Really, really do. So, um, by the way, it came up with a new word that's garden, but it sounds nasty, but it ain't. There's a type of plant. It's one of my favorite summer annuals. Big and bold, big bushy looking annual. And it's called Mexican sunflower. The Latin name of it is Tithonia. What's that, Tithonia? Uh, no, really, what are you growing there? <laughs> okay, this is falling flat. Uh, I was in a uh, Mexican mart, a uh, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, Latino market, and they had sugar cane for sale to eat. I'm thinking I could get that and plant it. I just want to throw out a couple of things that for you vegetable gardeners out there. Um, you know, a lot of people plant, they try to plant like normal, but it wouldn't stop raining. And then it got dry. It's really, really dry out there. I was at, I was at the Agriculture Museum on Lakeland Drive in Jackson, a cool place, uh, started back in the 1980s. And they've got a little garden behind the, the doctor's uh you know, the, 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 the doctor's office, called Doctor's Garden. And uh, Master Garden has been taking care of it for a long time. We started it back in the 80s. And uh, we've got, you know, flowers and herbs and some heirloom things. And uh, and the herbs are medicinal. They're culinary and all. But they were, were really, really wilting yesterday. I was out there uh, repairing uh, one of the raised beds. And so I had to water things really good. And that's kind of unusual this time of year. But uh, if you're going to water your plants, if they need watering, Instead of watering all the time, try this. Water twice a few minutes apart. Start at one side, at one end, water everything. Uh, go inside, get your glass of water, wipe the sweat off your brow. Go back out and water a second time, uh, including in containers, raised beds, containers, regular dirt. That second water, the first water sort of sets the soil up. It swells up. Uh, 
and, and where it's like a sponge that swells up. Second water really soaks in and pushes first watering down deep. And you can go twice as far between soakings by watering twice a few minutes apart than just uh, hitting stuff every day. See, uh, I always figured it was the amount of water. Yeah, it is, but after a certain point, uh, you know, if you, you know, when you water stuff, it starts standing on top of the dirt or running off because the water is a, uh, it's a cation exchange or some kind of tension there, and it won't soak in. So, so water it to sort of set it up, and then come back a little bit later, and the second one just sucks right in. So you got to give the dirt a little break. Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, a lot of uh, old hand gardeners, in, including myself, if it's going to rain, I'll go out and I'll water ahead of time. Just a little bit to where when it rains, it soaks right in instead of runs off. You know, or if it rains a little bit, I'll go out second time afterwards and water second time. Anyway, just a little truth. It especially works on container plants. Hey, let's slide up to Neshoba County and see what Bill's up to. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm pretty good. And you? So far, so good. What's up? Great. Okay. Uh, I uh, want to plant a uh, living fence. And uh, I got some uh, trifoli orange from uh, a neighbor. Yeah. Uh, I realized that everybody screams and yells is invasive, uh, but uh, that hasn't been my experience. But anyway, will it grow in the shade? Uh, yeah, trifoliate orange. And for folks who are not sure of this, this is used as a rootstock for citrus plants. And if the citrus won't grow because it's too far north or something, the rootstock sprouts out. It's really thorny. It's got small, uh, they look like, well, they're not oranges and not lemons. They're about the size of a golf ball. They're kind of a slightly furry orangey color. Real pretty flowers. Interesting fruit. Almost inedible. It's almost all seed and real sour. Uh, it makes a good, good friends. But now... Uh, and it might be illegal in some parts of town because if somebody gets hung up in it, you know, it's, it can be trouble. But anyway, it, it, it won't be as thick in the shade. So, you know, if you're going to put it in the shade, you might need to snip the tips off the branch to make it bush out a little bit, a little uh -huh. pruning. Okay. Well, I can do that. That doesn't sound too hard. Yeah. And uh, the, the stuff that you cut, when you cut it off, the stuff you cut off, you can spray paint it white and stick gumdrops on it. <laughs> Give it to kids. We did that as a Christmas tree when I was a kid. I got one right now. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we usually have trouble deciding on what kind of tree to have. I think we made, just made a decision. Yeah. Now, the the only problem about the this will make a good living fence. It's not a good hedge because they drop their leaves in where you can see right through it. But uh, it'll it'll sure keep cattle and deer and, and neighborhood kids out of your yard. No question about that. A real thorny. Yeah, I, I'm, my main uh, test is armadillos. Oh no, so, this 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 won't work. Armadillos going to go right, right, right under, uh, through, and around it. So if you're going to do this, when you when you plant these things, put you a little chicken wire in between the plants, just a low little thing, and the the plants will grow into the chicken wire, and you'll have a permanent little low fence in between them. That'll keep the rabbits and the armadillos and stuff out. But I'll go ahead and just stretch a you know just a a, a knee high thing of of uh, chicken wire between them, and let it all grow together. Okay, so how far apart should I plant? Uh, well, they get pretty good size. You know, I'd say, you know, f f four or five feet is plenty close enough. But uh, okay. the, the chicken wire will help a whole lot. Okay. Thank you. All right. Appreciate your call. Now let's slide up to New Albany, way on, above, on up in the northeast part of the state. Hudson, what's going on? Hey, Felker. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, just thank you for your show. My wife and, enjoy and I have enjoyed your show for uh, quite a long time. Long so, time, long much. time. Appreciate it. Uh, oh, I have a question about uh, growing lawn grass. Is that something you could uh, help us with? Uh, well, I, I studied turf management at Mississippi State and uh, wrote the okay. for, wrote the forward to a book called The Perfect Lawn, but that doesn't mean that I can help you a lot. I can give it a try. Well, sounds, like, sounds like I'm talking to the right guy then. Um, we have a lawn, and it's just been in a poor condition, and uh, so we have somebody who uh, spraying herbicide for the broadleaf weeds and undesirables and uh, and uh, have fertilized, and so it's looking better, but there are uh, bare spots, and 
we don't really want to do turf. We want to grow grass. We want to grow from seed. And we wanted to do zoysia, but I understand that's very difficult to get, especially because of the freeze last winter. And um, the, the backyard that we want to plant uh, is there are two big oak trees on each side of a uh, probably rectangular about, uh, I don't know, a third of an acre, yeah. probably maybe a quarter of an acre of spot. Uh, and... Uh, so it, it so it, it gets a, a fair amount of kind of mixed sunlight and shade yeah. throughout the day. So what would you recommend that we plant to develop a lawn, a good lawn? There's there's always a back there established, yeah. but yeah. it's just like I say, very spotty. Okay, well, let, let me preface this uh, with a disclaimer. No matter what I say, Aunt Mamie does it different, and she's going to argue with both of us. But so I'm going to stick with what, in general, what all professional turf people know is what they teach at Mississippi State and LSU and Texas A&M and University of Georgia. It's what they teach because we know that in general, this is true. Number one, if you've got 50 percent or more shade, you are out of the grass business. That's what ground covers and mulches and shade plants are for. Grass will tolerate shade, but it doesn't do well under the best of conditions. Your best one for the shade is going to be St. Augustine, and it's, it gets kicked pretty hard up in North Mississippi. But uh, right. St. Augustine has a wider leaf. It can gather more energy because the leaves are wider than other grasses can in the shade. It's all about energy, co- collecting energy from the sun. So zoysia has a real thin leaf. Now, zoysia, they say it'll grow in the shade. It will once it's established, but trying to get it started, it doesn't get enough energy in the shade to get a really good root system in the first season. So getting it started in the shade is really difficult. By the way, you can't really get good seed for zoysia. You know, you, 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 there are some, but they're not that great. Anyway, what I would recommend, and, and, and this is based on 40 years, over 40 years of training and observation, would be to plant something else in the shade. You know, make it instead of wall to wall grass with trees sticking up out of it, which is a meadow and a forest combination, is, uh, you know, make a distinct line around your trees and on one side is grass and on the other side is something else. Uh, this is just good. Okay. This is just good advice. Um, second of all, if you're going to grow grass at all, first of all, you need to, to, to decide what kind of grass you want. And then give that grass what it needs. Of all the four major grass we have, zoysia, St. Augustine, centipede, Bermuda, those are the major ones, and then there's some others. But each one has got slightly different requirements that's best for it. Uh, For example, zoysia needs to be mowed at a moderate uh, height. If you cut it real close, it's going to peter out. Bermuda grass likes to be cut close. St. Augustine needs to be cut high. So even your mowing height and how much you fertilize will affect whether the grass is going to do well or not, and it changes. So decide what grass you want, and let's do a little quick research on what it needs. And you can get that from Mississippi State. You go to msucares.com. It's their coordinated access to research, and uh, click in lawn care, and it'll have the publication that is absolutely top-notch. And look up your kind of grass. It'll tell you exactly what it needs. So... Anyway, okay. so mowing height is going to be important. I would not try to get grass started in the shade, and this is based on, again, 40 years of watching professional people try and fail. Um, and then <laughs> out in the other area, if you want, when you say you want a, a lawn, you want something that looks like just grass, right? Yeah. 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 Well, then, then you, you need to decide if you're going to be using herbicides, uh, different herbicides can be used on different grasses. So Bermuda grass grows fine. It, it's your, your most versatile, but it won't take any shade at all. So anyway, long story short, msucares.com, lawn care, and it'll give you what each of those grasses need. And uh, if you want some okay. more, more detailed information, send me an email because, I mean, I can really get into it, but it's starting to get complicated here. <laughs> 
Well, I certainly appreciate the advice. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Hudson, ride around uh, older parts of town and and pay it in, and make your make your eyes focus on something that we normally don't focus in the older parts of town where the landscapes look nice. Look at the percentage of grass versus other stuff, especially in shady yards, and you'll start seeing that grass is used as a as a pathway or a throw rug rather than wall to wall carpet. And there's so many cool plants that'll that'll do well under the shade, and it looks better too a lot easier okay yeah that's a good advice I, i'll do that thank you very much all right appreciate it who i might have come across a little negative on that one i'm real real fun very fun i i when i was with extension sir i consulted with athletic fields uh high school golf courses things like that i really love a well-maintained lawn but it is hard to pull off Without irrigation, without the right kind of mowing, without the right kind of fertilizer, it's hard to pull off because grass is a living, breathing creature. And if you don't give it what it needs, it's going to sulk. And the way it sulks is it gets thin and you get weeds. So, uh, again, it's a high-maintenance creature. If you can't give it that, let's uh, go find a different approach. And before we go to our cheesy music, we got time to take Rachel's call. Okay, let's go yeah, to— Yeah, we got it. Yeah, to, let's go to Eupora. Rachel, how are you this morning? Good morning. Howdy. I'm doing good. So I want to know how to grow moss on the ground in my front yard, a shady yard. Okay. How do I get it started and maintain it? Okay, uh, the three things that moss need. Now, this is something I can help with. I love moss. So a good friend of mine, Becky Potts, has got the coolest landscape, and it is all moss, sun and shade. But it needs three things. It needs uh, it needs uh, it does best in the shade. Uh, it needs to have a compacted soil, so stomp all over it, and it needs an acidic soil. Now I don't know about you, Pora, uh, uh, whether you've got an acidic or alkaline soil there. If you call the county extension office and say, on average, are our soils acidic or alkaline? If he says acidic, uh-huh. you're good to go. If he says alkaline, um, it's going to be difficult because moss needs an acidic, compacted, really bad dirt is what it needs. Uh-huh. But but to, uh-huh. to answer your question, if you'll find some moss and uh, and just scrape it up, it's right on top of the ground, scrape it up and chop it up in little pieces, put it in a bucket, stir it up with some water, and just spread it all over the place and then stomp it in. Okay. The, yeah, so, some people uh, can say you need to put buttermilk on it. You don't have to. No. Yeah. No, you don't have to do all that. Not necessarily. Huh? No, you just need to what get about, it out there. Uh, on stones, on rock. Uh, well, uh, you know, again, it 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 it'll do fine, it, but it it's not uh-huh. gonna. You know, I've got moss. I've got a great big uh, stones that boulders in my front yard. I've got yeah. moss and and uh, succulents and a few other plants growing just on there. But um, if you want to get it started on stone, that's where I'm mixing with a little buttermilk help. Buttermilk. I forget okay. what I forget what it is about buttermilk, but it it sets up some kind of little thing. But uh, just chop uh-huh. it up in little bitty pieces. Uh, water, a little bit of buttermilk, buttermilk, and then spread it on, pat it into place. Thank you very much, Felder. Well, it's, it's real easy to say. It's not going to be that easy to do, Rachel. I see. Well, I've already got some started in the yard. Actually, it was there when I moved here. Okay, well, that, so that, that that's, that's good. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. It means it likes it. It's got good conditions for it. But notice that it's in really hard, compacted, sometimes kind of wet, but but just hard, compacted dirt. That's what it needs. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for rescuing me. I could answer this one. <laughs> uh, those of you who have lawns, again, it doesn't need to be watered. It doesn't need to be fertilized. But if you don't water and don't fertilize, it's going to be a really miserable lawn, and the weeds grow better. So mow it a little on the high side. Water at least every couple of three weeks if you can. Give it a little bit of fertilizer in the spring. And uh, that's what it takes to have a good quality lawn, plain and simple. Hey, I've seen a lot of garlic blooming right now, that old-fashioned kind of garlic. Some people call it elephant garlic, and some people say it's not really garlic. It's a leek, type of leek. I don't want to get into all that. Um, But it's blooming right now, and it is a beautiful plant. It's not real, you know, it's kind of a silvery, white, grayish-looking flower, size of a, not, the size of a fist, and they're pretty plants. I see along the roadside when I was uh, going up north the other day. Anyway, if you grow garlic, 
This is a good one to grow because it is pretty. It's, it's as pretty as a daffodil, and it blooms this time of year. But if you're growing it for garlic, next year when those little things start to come up to make the flowers, pop them off. Because right now they're sending all the energy up in that flower, and instead it could be going down into the bulbs, making bigger cloves. If you're growing it for garlic, pop that flower off. Uh, leave a few flowers because they're pretty. If you haven't grown garlic before and you've given it a try, the time to harvest is when it starts to turn yellow. And it's starting to do that for a lot of folks. It is in my garden. When the leaves start to turn yellow, plant dies down, it goes dormant just like daffodils. So it's getting close to, if not already, time to dig up your garlic. And if you do that, cut off the flowers, cut it off to where the cloves only have, uh, the bulbs only have about a, a two inch section of stem. And then spread them out in the shade out of the rain. Let them kind of cure and and, and and dry, they'll store a whole lot better then. Now let's uh, go over to Moon Lake and talk with John. John, how are you this morning? Felder, how you doing? So far, so good. Tell us where Moon Lake is. Moon Lake is in Cahoma County, mm-hmm. and I believe it is the largest natural lake in the state of Mississippi. It was an oxbow lake, you know, formed by the, by the Mississippi River uh, after the river change course back in you know the early 1800s probably from that large earthquake they had and, yeah and i understand uh, and it, yeah this up in the north part of the delta I don't, don't they still have some of those paddle fish in there oh yeah yeah in They're, fact uh they caught one um, a couple of years ago that fish had been tagged in like you know st louis in the river and uh you know he swam his way down to vicksburg swam up the yazoo tallahatchie Cold water and into Moon Lake. That is a bizarre Very looking fish. Paint. That is a bizarre looking <laughs> fish. It has a little thing on it. Just, just bizarre looking fish. But anyway, what's what you got going on? What can we help you with? Well, since grass seems to be the topic of uh, at least the last half hour, uh, I thought I'd continue that. I've, I've got St. Augustine in part of my yard, and it looks good. You know, I fertilize it once a year, maybe now, but I'm trying to get it to run. And yeah. fill in some places where you know I didn't thought it initially, and it's yeah. starting to do that. So, what should I cut it high? Should I cut it low? No, say, what, say, what, say, so kind of forces it to run more. Okay, the three things in order of importance to get St. Augustine to get thick and deep rooted and run in order of importance the three things one, mow high. Raise your mower up, throw the wrench away. St. Augustine grows across the top of the ground. When you cut it close, there goes all of its energy gathering ability. The, you know, so it needs to be mowed high. And anybody who doesn't do that, I don't have anything to say to them anymore. That's just the way the grass needs. Second of all, and, and do this all the time. Uh, second, it needs a little bit of fertilizer, but not any of that agriculture stuff. The ammonium nitrate that's in triple 13. It, it's like a big flush strong of growth that shuts down the rooting process. So give it a good quality lawn food. You know, it's got a slow release, long lasting fertilizer. But make the bag go twice as far as it says it go. You don't have to push it. So uh, keep it lean and mean, but use a good, long-lasting, steady type of nitrogen fertilizer. And by the way, it's called urea if you want to use an agriculture product, urea as opposed to ammonium nitrate. So mow high, fertilize okay. with a good, long-lasting stuff. And the third thing, a lot of people don't realize this, but a grass plant only lives – about three weeks, two or three weeks before it dies. And meanwhile, it sends down roots, it sends out runners and new plants. So every month, you've got a completely different lawn. You know, you can spray paint it blue, and a month later, that's all gone. Uh, so what we're trying to do is not not keep it healthy. We're trying to help it replace itself. That's where those runners come in. So if you can give, if, if you go three or four weeks without a rain, that means that that new lawn doesn't have good roots, and in turn, it can't replace itself. So if you don't get a good rain, at least every three or four weeks, the grass needs a good soaking, a good soaking from either rain or water. Every couple of weeks would be better. More than once a week is just counterintuitive, okay? I'm not going to say stupid because a lot of people have irrigation systems. Every turf person will say irrigation systems should be turned on once a week max, or maybe three times an hour apart, but a good soak in every week or two, at least every three or four weeks, that's what it takes to help that grass send out runners, and then they in turn send out runners. So mow high, 
good slow-acting fertilizer, not too much, and a good soaking at least every three or four weeks. That's all it takes, period. That's it. Okay. Hey, one, one quick question. All right, so when I don't, when I lay off the cuttings, uh, it looks like the St. Augustine is putting out a, like, seed pot. You know, it looks like it's heading out. Yeah, it'll, 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 it'll do that. It'll do that. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, you, but, but, you know, you can mow every week if you want to, but mow high. I mean, you know, if, yeah. you know, so that's it. Also, there's there's some weeds out there that look like St. Augustine, look like grass, and they send up weeds, you know, Dallas grass and crabgrass. They send uh, flower stalks up real, real fast. Centipede, uh, fertilize, centipede uh, grass sends up uh, seed heads, too. But anyway, that's a, that's a healthy thing. It says, it says that the grass is happy. So mow as often as you want, but always mow high. Cutting it close, it just, just beats it up. It wears it out. Okay. Good information. Appreciate yeah. it. And, and and by the way, this is the reason they have nice lawns around the library and the and the church and the schools and all. They have nice thick lawns because they don't mow it that often, and it always stays high and thick. That's what it wants. Well, I know in Florida they they always you know the Saint Augustine is you know probably four inches high, and it is always you know coming from Bermuda grass you know neighborhood, and you see the four inch Florida. St. Augustine, you think, man, what, are they just lazy or what? No, it's just, it's, it's, like, it's it, just a reason for everything. They're different creatures. They have different needs. Bermuda grass has runners under the ground. You know, it runs under the ground. St. Augustine arches over the top of the ground, and it needs those those leaves for, for energy. So anyways, they're different plants. It's just like dogs and cats or having a chihuahua versus a German shepherd. You treat them different because they're not the same. Good point. All righty, man. And uh, hey, right, st- uh, are you, hey, I got to ask you: Are you really from? Are you actually from the Delta? Uh, well, I was born in the same hospital that Elvis died in. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, you know, this uh, that's sort of a credential. I mean, it's like me saying yeah. people, when when I'm in England. It's now it's to a point where, where nobody remembers that hospital, you know, so downtown. So uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I just I, I, some people just look at you. I was just up at the uh, the Crossroads, uh, the Crossroads Festival, the Duke Joint Festival in Clarksdale. I'm hardcore down, born and raised, flunked out of Moorhead. Uh, yeah, I, I saw you there. In fact, you were the first person I've ever seen to walk out of a Duke Joint, and your head was down, and you were looking at the flowers that were popping up. Uh, it was it was at the uh, New Rocks. You were coming out of the New Rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you came out, you were looking at, you know, the the weeds that were growing. You know, next to the sidewalk, and then you start taking pictures. Of it. I don't know what flower. It is. Yeah, no, I was ta- I, I was taking pictures because you know, so many people think gardening is hard. No, you're just shoot, choosing the wrong plants. You know, Roxy Theater, old Roxy Theater, which is a, a music venue now. They've got some of the coolest old plants that are growing just in cracks of the sidewalk, and that's what I need in my yard. Because uh, contrary to, to what people may think, and I'm saying this publicly, I've said it for decades now, I'm not a good gardener. I'm a garden expert, but I'm not actually a good gardener. So I have to have plants that will grow in the crack of a sidewalk. So that's what I was doing. I was looking for good plants that prove uh, you don't have to be a horticulturist to have nice flowers. Anyway, good. Or in the back of a truck too. You yeah, know, I do stuff in the back of the truck too. Yeah, I do. You know, when when I when I head for overseas, I park my truck out in front of my house out in the sun, and nobody waters it for three months. And uh, you know, <laughs> if it can't take that, it ain't gonna make. And I found plants that'll take it. So anyway, good uh-huh. to hear from you, man. Good luck on it. Yep, you too. Thanks. All righty. So how we doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. I would not have. Uh have guessed to, to treat so much grass differently. Like, I've always just mowed the grass, and then you leave it alone. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and mostly, that's that's the number one thing is keep it mowed. But, you know, it's some grasses, if you cut them close, it just, it, it's, it's like not feeding them. Enough. You know, they, they, they get energy through their leaves. St. Augustine needs lots of leaves. So, anyway, it's just, you know, a lot of people don't realize, not a carpet. These are living, breathing creatures. And you don't treat a goldfish the same way you treat a cat. They're both, or you don't, cats and dogs are both four-legged furry pets, but you don't treat them the same. Same thing with grasses. It does. Now, I have to be a proponent of what they call mow what grows. When I was a kid, we didn't have Weed killers, you know, this is a long time ago. We, we didn't have good mowers. And basically, we just, whatever was out there, we mowed it. And we had clover and stickers and henbit and dandelion and a little bit of grass. 
but different kinds of grass. And so in a case like that, you just mow what grows. And if you're okay with that, that's the easiest solution. But if you want a perfect manicured monocrop lawn, you got to find out what grass you got and what does it want. I think it's Epictetus, uh, f- ancient philosopher, he said, uh, it's like a self-willed man. If you want to get it to do what you want, treat him his own way. So anyway, it's just like my daughter and my son. Yeah, they're different as they can be. Got to treat them different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let me throw out a couple of things. One is, um, and I don't know of any events going on right now. It's getting too hot. People it's kind of shutting down. But there's things going on at farmer's markets all over the state. I go to the one in Jackson. Actually, I go to two. I go to the old farmer's market. But I also go to the one down at the fairgrounds. And they've got vendors who grow and produce all sorts of things, you know, guys who make birdhouses, you know, sell them for 10 bucks a piece. There's a man down there who, who just grows heirloom plants, trees and shrubs, flowers, potted plants, and uh, old-fashioned plants you can't buy anywhere else, honey, uh, all sorts of vegetables and fruits that are coming in. So farmer's markets are a really cool little place to get you a little convivia, go out there and, and uh, meet the people who are actually doing stuff. And if you got kids or maybe you got a neighbor who doesn't get out much, go. It's a nice outing. It's a nice outing. Sometimes you got to avert your eyes because uh, the uh, people at the stalls, they really, you know, you don't want to make eye contact with them because you're not going to buy their stuff. But it's a cool place to go, and it supports local farming. So I think that's a, a real good thing. Take a kid if you get a chance. Um, and then before we go, this, uh, well, we had a call, but it dropped off. Um I've started to get my tomatoes, started to get my peppers, and um, my okra is starting to come in. I don't grow okra because I eat it. I don't like okra. There, I said it. I don't like You fry it hard, put a bunch of ketchup on it, I'll eat it. But I grow okra because it is a pretty plant. It's a type of hibiscus, got pretty flowers. I grow a burgundy kind that's got kind of a maroon-looking leaves and pods. But if you're growing okra for for food or for uh, for for just for fun, like squash, you need to keep it picked because if you don't pick one, all of the energy goes into those seeds. It shuts the plant down. It's concentrating on making seeds. So even if you don't want to eat it, snip it off. Get rid of those uh, squash and the okra so that the plants will keep blooming and putting new stuff on. Uh, it's really important to, to to keep them picked. So there's my there's my note on that. Uh, one one other thing, squash. A lot of people plant squash, and there's an insect. looks like a little wasp. It's a clear-winged sort of red and black moth. It looks just like a wasp when it's flying. It lays eggs, and these caterpillars go in. They're called squash vine borer. Not much you can do other than spraying a lot of insecticides unless you want to cover it with net, insect netting. You, every, you go all, all over Japan, all over Europe, all over England, Everybody covers their plants with netting to keep the insects out, except for us for some reason. Anyway, put some netting out there. You have to lift it up with squash and zucchinis. You have to lift it up and hand pollinate the flowers. It sounds kind of kinky, but netting will keep bees out. So uh, anyway, netting is a really good way to keep a lot of insects off. Now, um uh, I would encourage folks to, if you're not, if you're socially media savvy, you probably don't know about it. If you don't, here's a safe place to try. Try this. If you don't like social media, don't be, don't be, don't be that way. Go online and go to Facebook and type in Mississippi Gardening, Mississippi Gardening, and just look at it. And if you like the way it looks, all you got to do is click on, you know, t- t- to join it. It's real gardeners. There's no spam. Nobody argues. We we are we we make them go away or we put them in timeout. It's a nice site where people show off what they grow, and they also ask each other questions about what to do. Um, Dr. Gary Bachman is one of the the folks who checks in all the time. So it's a whole bunch of experts, but it's just gardeners getting together. Now let's go to Flowood talk with Wayne. Wayne let's get them real quick. Yeah. What's what's a, what's going on, Wayne? Hey, yeah, I want to see what is the best time of year. How do I do that? I heard everything except what 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 was the plant? Was it camellia? 
camellia and crepe myrtle. Yeah, uh, crepe myrtles root best in the winter time. If they drop their leaves, in general, if they drop their leaves, they root best in the winter. You can root them now if you take a little small cutting. Camellias and other other, other evergreens root best in June or July. New growth kind of toughened up a little bit. Kind of a short cutting, not not big old long branches, but uh, this is a good time to start rooting evergreen shrubs. Thank you. All righty, good luck on it. And make you a little tent, you know, get you a little hoop house or get you some big cola bottles and cut the bottom off, throw the cap away to put it over the pot. little miniature greenhouse with a vent at the top to let the steam out. But uh, keep the humidity high, real important. If you can try to root stuff, do it in the shade, bright light, not full sun. Cover them up with a little plastic that's vented to help keep the humidity high. So that's pretty much it. Kind of, kind of blew through this today, didn't we? Yeah, we uh we made it. Java's a wizard back here. He does so good. I I'm working on it. Yeah, Java he he's out this week, but uh Abram, you're doing pretty good. Well, Do thank it. you you're, very much. You're doing good, young man. I'm horticulturist failed to rushing. Don't know it all. Don't want to know it. Wish I didn't know some of the stuff I do know because it just slows me down. But I do like to talk with folks about gardening. I'm on the Mississippi Gardening Facebook page if you have questions. Me and Gary Bobman and a lot of other folks. But meanwhile, during the week, it's going to be hot soon. Get your plants ready. Water them good and deep, but don't keep them wet. Train their roots to grow down deep so they can withstand the heat and drought that's to follow. But tease their roots down deep by watering and letting it get dry between soaking. Take a kid to a farmer's market. Let them meet people who really grow stuff for a living. If you get a chance, uh, chat with them. Find out what they like. What do they do with their leftover stuff? And do what we do best, folks, and that's get dirty. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android